Greetings, flesh creatures. It is I, Megatron. On behalf of TFYLP, I want to congratulate you for listening to the most refined collector podcast on this miserable little planet Earth. Yes. Here you'll find knowledgeable fans discussing every aspect of Transformers and beyond. Now, enjoy the show while I continue my path to complete conquest of all of you miserable biological entities. Predacons! Terrorize! Hi, welcome to TFLP episode 463. We have another pre-recorded episode this week uh, for the holidays, uh, yet another interview. Um, so tonight I am joined by Nick. Hello. And Paul. Yep. And Phil. Good evening. And our special guest tonight uh, for the Im- uh, for the interview, Sam from Devil's Do. Hey, what's going on? Yeah, th- this, this topic... Yeah, it's topical because of uh, there's been a big shakeup in the Transformers comic um, world. The IDW license seems to be moving to someone else, and there's been a lot of discussion around that. And I think it just dawned on me, like, hey, I know someone that knows knows something about the comic industry and worked in it and was actually involved with a little bit of the Transformers stuff. And it's one of the the comic publishers that I think gets kind of left out of the conversation in the modern realm with, with transformers. And that's devil's do who did uh, all those crossover GI Joe and uh, transformer comics. And they're, they mainly um, as far as dealing with Hasbro, they were like the license holder for the GI Joe comics for a good long time. And Sam uh, had some experience there. Is that right? Uh, Yeah. Uh, So my intro as Sam from Devil's Do, uh, I haven't been with Devil's <laughs> since 2010, uh, well after we lost the Joe license. Um, but I, I started at Devil's Do in uh, 2003, I believe, as an intern. Uh, just really loved the fact that they had G.I. Joe as a license. Uh, so I came in around, I want to say like issue 24 of our G.I. Joe run uh, as an intern. And through my, uh, that was 2003 and I left 2010. So in that seven years, I held many different hats, starting as an intern, working as uh, inventory manager, web store manager, uh, eventually ending at assistant publisher, doing like the, all the boring stuff, like the number stuff that I think I know, Paul, you know, the boring back ends of businesses. So. Yeah. That's the fun stuff. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. it, it, exactly. See, here at TFLP, that's what we like to focus on, is all of that. You know, Financials. The, the yeah. logistics. Yeah, I worked on all the stuff that you can get yelled at for. Uh, mm. <laughs> yeah. all, the, all the number stuff, the, the fun side. And uh, I've done my best over the last 10 years to purge as much of the uh, number information out of my head and now i only remember like the really fun creative stuff that was happening in the office so like i i do remember a couple errors that i made here and there uh that were directly my fault but as far as like remembering print runs and and dollar amounts that stuff's just gone you know yeah Yeah. it's all it's all very i mean was that that was like you lived that job for that long, like you were really into it, right? Like it was your, you were into comics, you were into GI Joe, and it was it was like a passion job, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, it was for the Joe. Uh, I gave zero craps about comics in general. Mm. <laughs> I literally, literally only started there because of the Joe license, because it was there. And then when I was at a at a position where like we were in pitch meetings and they'd say, "Oh, let's get uh, like Adam Warren to do a cover," I'd be like. That's cool. Who's that? And everybody's like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a bad example because I know who Adam Warren is and he's maybe never liked comics in general, but yeah. And actually, I should point out that this Joe shelf behind me was built uh, to fit my first cubicle there. Like, it's the huh. black and gray that we had as the uh, cubicle paint, like the different colors. And I spent a weekend there one day building this exactly to fit in my little cube up against the wall. Hmm. And it's lived with me ever since. It's awesome to see them all lined up like that. That's it really looks, nice. It looks really good. I feel like this might be part of the reason I got the internship because I was like, <laughs> I have 
like every joke. And I have a complete run of the Marvel <laughs> series. And they're like, oh, well, we don't have an archive of that right now. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Was that, there, was that Peter? issue 25 or issue 50 that had all the Joes on the cover? Uh, the Marvel run or the Devil's Do one? Devil's Do. We did issue 25 of America's Elite. That was the one with the big wraparound cover with all the Joes. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. That, one, that was a convention exclusive for... World War Three issue one, and at San Diego that year at the booth, if somebody was buying that comic, I told them they could have it for free if they pointed at a Joe and I couldn't name who it was. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't end up giving away uh, a book because all the hard ones nobody else knew well enough to point at them. <laughs> <laughs> How about the blue guy with the hood? <laughs> <laughs> So before we really get into it, you know, th- just if you're listening, this may sway pr- pretty heavy on the Joe side of things, you know, which, you know, we, t- we dabble in, in here and there. But if you know if that doesn't interest you, I would still hold on because we are going to talk about Transformer stuff. But we're going to let the conversation go wherever it shall. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. so l- let me tie this in a little bit to the, the Transformers thing, because um you know, there was there was a parallel track going on with the Transformers comic book from Dreamwave at the time. And um, Sam, the, the way I remember this getting started in the early 2000s was Wizard Magazine, which was, you know, kind of the, the comic book, you know, Bible at the time. They did a story about, you know, 80s properties coming back. And they had J. Scott Campbell did a pinup of the G.I. Joe characters and uh, Pat Lee uh, did a pinup of Transformers. Um, there was a there was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Thundercats pinup in the same issue. Um, I, I don't remember off the top of my head who the artists were on those. I, I want to say Joe Madrera on the Ninja Turtles, um, and, and maybe Ali Garza on the Thundercats, but but I'm not 100 percent you know right on that. And you know that that sort of sparked this whole big like yeah like those those are all comic books we'd love to see. Those are all properties that we love, and they didn't really have this this presence in cartoons on toy shelves or or uh, in comic books is sort of what they were in the 80s and then here comes devil do uh part of image all of a sudden with like yeah we're we, we got the license we're going to do it they got j scott campbell again to do the uh the covers for the miniseries and uh the huge comic book artist name and um you know that that took off, and then Dreamwave got the uh, the Transformers license, and and that took off, and both those books were selling really really great numbers for when they came out, um, and, and that sort of started this uh, you know resurgence in the comic books that seems commonplace today, but but didn't really exist for the vast majority of the nineties and, and early two thousands when it kicked off. So that's, that's my memory of that. You know, Sam, you, you jumped in. It sounds like actually working in that a little bit afterwards. How did, how did you decide like, shoot, let's go try and get a job with these guys who are doing this. And what, what did your experience uh, working for them and the, the GI Joe comics look like? So uh, this is a little bit fresh in my mind. Uh, there's a book that came out recently cataloging the marvel run of gi joe and uh, i'm friends with the guys that released it it's called action after action report and when they announced they were doing the second volume they reached out and they're like hey would you do the forward for it for the devil's due era and i was like sure so i recently just revisited all this stuff and kind of took a look back and and, at my own history which i didn't really put in the forward but like i retouched on like the joe history in general uh i that particular issue of wizard i remember um i don't remember where it falls within like uh where we were progressing and i'll say we even though i wasn't there um where devil's do was progressing at releasing their issue one because you know like an issue one isn't like four months out working on a like obtaining a license you're at least a year out um so the the eerie thing is gi joe issue one was released on september 12th 2001 so the day after oh the, attack, um, the Joes all strapped on their boots and they were back for us all, like on our comic racks all of a sudden, which was uh, eerie at the least, you know, just the, the timing of it all. Um, that's, that's I had no idea about that. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, 
there, there was a lot of shakeup. I mean, sales numbers were crazy because it was the number one, and the, the numbers are already in well before the book's on the shelf, you know. But, <clears throat> you know, as somebody that, that wasn't planning ahead and didn't have, like, a pull box because I didn't really care about comics at the time, uh, finding a G.I. Joe issue, number one, was next to impossible for me. Like, I was scouring my city, and then, like, also, like, can I go leave the house? Like, <laughs> are we safe? Like, do I have to pay four dollars a gallon for gas? I mean, at at the time, that was crazy, and we're paying that right now. Right. <laughs> uh, it 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 took me a minute to hunt it down, and actually, I didn't. My wife uh, Liz found it for me, uh, and she was living in Chicago at the time. I was in St. Louis, and as you guys know, Devils do based in Chicago. Uh, so every time I'd come up and visit, I was like, man, I really want to go by this address that's like listed in the book, and just like see what's up like and in my mind I, I pictured it like i would show up and it would be a big warehouse and a bunch of guys with forklifts being like what do you want kid like this is a publishing house like i didn't know <laughs> what to expect um so it was it was around 2003 after i had moved here a couple of years into it and i was i had my pull box now at graham crackers uh i went in one day and there was a, a little flyer taped up uh on the wall that said hey do you like gi joe do you want to work in comics and I was like, oh, shit. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> was, yes, please. Yeah. It was their way <laughs> Thank of advertising you. for interns in the area. And I remember that it literally said, while you won't get the right G.I. Joe, you'll get to learn the ins and outs of the industry. And, like, I still have that flyer. I wish I had it with me right now. Um, I still have that flyer just to, like, say fuck you to that flyer because I did end up writing some G.I. Joe. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, of course. Of course I never get to. <clears throat> yeah, so... <laughs> I started in as an intern, uh, and then uh, I stuck around well well past my internship because we had, uh, I think it was six-week internships. They were unpaid, and I, I was there for maybe three months, and they were eventually like, hey, we feel horrible. We can't pay you. You should uh, just stop coming in working for free all the time. I was like, cool. Uh, I'd say like a month later, I was just kind of like, man, I want to work there, and I realized that they had no, like, having been there and known the studio uh, I knew they didn't have any sort of application, so I made my own. Like, literally made a Devil's Due application, and then <laughs> filled it out and gave it to them. And they, like, messaged me later. They were like, hey, yeah, can you come work here? <laughs> <laughs> you smart. Work <laughs> for me. <laughs> so, uh, I just kind of want to touch on that that resurgence, though, that, that we talked about. Um, so, Devil's Due, their G.I. Joe number one came out in 2001. Uh, September 12th, 2001. September 12th. Uh, it, it kicked off the 80s resurgence. Uh, Dreamwave, uh, I believe it was early 2002. Um, and then, yeah, like the books just started following after that. Like Turtles got their revamp. Thundercats were in print. He-Man got a comic. Um, Battle of the Planets. We started doing Voltron. Uh, we, we did Micronauts. So like there are so many so many books and like you just have to look back and like I I usually myself give it credit because the whole eighties boom started in that early two thousands and now we're at you know uh, movie twenty years level, later you know like yeah and all the like now you look at the the toys on shelves and like all the all the retro versions of everything it's yeah. I mean it was bound to happen without Devil's Due. But like the fact that they just squeaked one out right before everything else started, you got to give them a little bit of uh, a credit there, you know. Yeah, I think the comics were really integral in like getting the groundswell of the '80s culture stuff to to boil up. I mean, you got to get the nerds first, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We we set the trends, you know. <laughs> So were you there? I apologize, I don't remember my timeline exactly right. But were were you there? And was Devil's Due still running the book when the GI Joe movie came out? No, the movie is actually what caused Devil's Due to lose the license. Oh, yeah. So that was two thousand seven, I believe, when um, the rumbling started happening. I think huh. the first movie came out in two thousand nine, and we finished up our book in two thousand eight, even though the license had expired. But we had just uh, advertised issue one of twenty, like uh, issue one of twelve. Like we promised, like a, a year arc. Uh, and at that point, we just thought, like, oh, the license is going to renew and no problem. And Hasbro came back and they're like, whoa, 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 wait, we've got like we've got like this um, 
big project coming up and like we, we want to shop this around now and we're like well we just solicited like four books out and like we already started the storyline so they amended our contract just to allow us to do the last 12 issues of the world war three book um and part of it was mm. that throughout that year we weren't allowed to break it into smaller trades we had to collect it at the end into just one omnibus mm. yeah uh so and i i, I think the the whole thing with IDW, like we, we went in and pitched. I don't know who all pitched because I didn't go to that meeting. Um, but we were there. IDW was there. And I, I assume it was Dynamite and maybe Boom that went. Uh, I don't wow. think anyone was scared about the book at that point. Um, but from what I can tell, having followed it closely after we lost the license, uh, IDW's plan was we're going to put out a movie adaptation along with the ongoing book and a prequel to the movie. And I was like, okay, so I guess that got it. <laughs> but I mean, truth be told, it, it, it could have just been like you know the the time was right for them to break from Devil's Due. Like maybe relationship wasn't that great, you know. Like maybe whoever was running the Joe brand at the time at Hasbro. Um, I mean, in that five minutes running the Joe brand because yeah, you know, we're there on the Joe brand. I, I wonder if it wasn't also because IDW had taken over the Transformers license and they wanted that shared universe thing to start. Oh yeah, no, no, that that probably had a huge part in it. And we did we did have a a meeting internally when uh, Dreamwave lost their their light or I guess lost everything <laughs> disappeared when, when Pat Lee Pat Lee did. I do I do remember <laughs> that meeting and uh, blowing everyone's mind that like our first book would be out by 2005 and that's like the movie year you know and everybody's like oh that's great you know we'll focus on that but I mean obviously that never came to fruition. <laughs> So you said they were all at this meeting. Did Hasbro just be like, all right, comic companies come and wow us. And they had everybody together on the same day. Yeah. That's crazy. I've never heard anything like that. I mean, I wasn't there, but I'm pretty sure it's like literally you're sitting in the waiting room while everybody else is there. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's pitch. You don't want to spread those out over days and forget, you know, the details of these pitches. That's so crazy. I never heard anything like that. I didn't know how these big licenses work, but that's wow. (laughs) As were once for um, like a licensing summit. And it was like an awards dinner where like we got an award for doing their Joe book and somebody got an award for the best like toothbrush adaptation of My Little Pony or something like that. <laughs> it was so weird to have all these other companies just sitting around this like dining room area. It was, it was weird. But that seems to be Hasbro's M.O. Like, just like, come here, come to our house. You know? Yeah. Uh, maybe we should introduce TJ since we have a, a, new, a new face. <laughs> here comes a new challenger. <laughs> How's it going, guys? Uh, so I'm TJ Shevlin. Uh, currently, I work for Super 7. Uh, prior to that, I worked at IDW Publishing. Uh, the, except what I got to do there with G.I. Joe and Transformers, I got to do some assists on um, Revolution, and uh, I ran the uh, IDW San Diego Comic Art Gallery, worked with Kevin Eastman there for almost four years, and yeah. Boss, and I've known Nick for what 15 years, something like that, at least yeah. probably longer because you were a customer before that. <laughs> yeah. TJ and I worked together at St. Mark's Comics for a very long time. It, it was a blue, 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 blue dynamic there. I'll let you. <laughs> well, what, I, I think I interrupted you, Nick. Huh? I think I interrupted you. You were going to ask uh, Sam something. Or, or did I not? No, I don't think you did. I think I got my so, question out so about this. Sam, you guys were <laughs> running this license. Um, you guys were doing almost uh, an, an extension of the Larry Hama sort of Joe storylines for a little bit. You mm-hmm. were introducing some new characters. Some of the characters you introduced actually became action figures and toys. So, so how did that work in terms of you guys were doing – you know, very 80s based stuff for part of it. The toy line was very 80s based. And then, you know, Hasbro went very non 80s based with the toy line for a while. So what did that all look like as you were working there? Uh, it, it, it was, it was kind of loose as far as like, I, and you can tell if you look back at the, the Marvel run where it's like, Hey Larry, you have to throw this vehicle in there. And introduce these six characters, you know, like that was always obvious. And he did it with grace and ease. Uh, for us, it, it wasn't that tight of a leash. Um, our stuff was mostly uh, toned down the violence, 
tone down the sexuality. Um, but as far as like the stuff getting integrated, it was always like, oh, they're paying attention to us. Like if like the, the Kamakura figure that came out, you're like, oh, yeah. they do read it. Like the comps that we send them actually end up somewhere. <laughs> Well, I'm really surprised they like never made you guys play with the Valor versus Venom stuff or like this. What was it? Spy Troops or whatever. Well, that's that's the thing. Yeah. So, so those two brands came out during our run. Yeah. And we did our best to incorporate the figures that we liked from it into mm-hmm. the storyline. It wasn't anything like forced by Hasbro. We were just like, oh, this guy's cool. We'll pull him in. But I think it's... Hasbro also knew how fast they were going to turn over these these storylines that, yeah. you know, there's no reason to like force this upon us you know? especially but like when you look at what they did with the idw stuff and how they made them do combiner wars and you know uh Titans return yeah mm. they really forced <laughs> that stuff in there to the detriment of some of the the storylines they were doing at the time like the the lost light stuff and all of that whereas you guys got to do pretty much this un, uninterrupted really great gi joe stuff that i you know adored i, uh, I think that's the the upside of being the bastard brand, <laughs> they they cared about the Transformers stuff. You know, yeah. that's a flagship. Uh, I was I was always told, uh, maybe not directly, but I was always told that Joe was a dead brand. You know, so it was kind of like we, it was our playground, and like Hasbro would show up every now and then, be like, "I'm taking this ball home." You know, yeah. But I can see I can see them having a lot more say in like what to do with with their baby brand <laughs> Transformers. There were two strengths, um, whenever I think about the Devil's Due stuff, um, two strengths that um, I always lean on. One was just how cool it was that uh, Kamakura, you mentioned earlier, and Billy both got to play such really integral roles in all of that stuff. And it must have been fun to almost get to treat them like clean slates in a way that other characters prior didn't necessarily get to be. And then um, the fact that um, even, even if it ended and you guys didn't want it to, it's nice when you look at it because there's a definitive beginning, middle, and end to the way it all works. That's so nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, Kamakura especially, like, getting to grab somebody, pluck them out of the Marvel book, and then, like, just flesh them out, you know, that, that, was, a, that was a huge deal to us, and, like, it, it resonated very well with the fans. Uh, thinking back on Billy specifically, I, I feel like he got done dirty. Uh, like, his... His end in World War Three was a, a little rushed and not what it should have been for the son of Cobra Commander, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, getting all that leash to just do what you want with these characters and rarely have anything other than, you know, stop putting guns on the cover, you know. <laughs> that was nice. Wait, but... Yeah. But... Just... <laughs> yeah, I... I, I wish I had like uh, files to share it ready right now. Um, yeah. But if you go and look at uh, the Yojo archive of the Devil's Due books, look around like issue 14 to like 24 of America's Elite, and you'll start seeing weapons disappear, and everyone's just standing stoic, and then there's just heads. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was along the lines of um, oh man, it, it went from no more weapons, no weapons pointed at the viewer. Uh, no weapons pointed at other characters, and then no one in peril. What is this design by committee bullcrap? Why would they do that? <laughs> that I mean, literally, that's just covered. Like you know. No, I get like, it. I get it. It's just on the cover. But like, oh god. <laughs> Part of what's so cool is like all the tech and the laser guns, and like, why wouldn't you sell a laser gun? <laughs> yeah. It's astonishing to me that they would just do that. And I also feel like we got the same sort of freedom when it came to our Joe versus Transformer brand, or, or to our to our books, just because uh, as as cherished as Transformers is to Hasbro, yeah. this always just seems like an Elseworld thing to them, and they're like, yeah, go go nuts, you know, go crazy. <laughs> so that that was always nice, and I feel like we did what you're supposed to do in every Joe versus Transformer series, and we killed Bumblebee like right away. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Even the the um, the IDW one the, doesn't the Bumblebee die right away with the uh, in Tom's book. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a rite of passage for the Joe versus Transformer series. <laughs> I was I was just looking and it didn't it just dawned on me that that really awesome Cobra Decepticon logo that was from Devil's Due that was not from the Dreamwave yeah. part of it. That, that was, uh, I forgot about Mike that. Hammer, 
uh, our graphic designer at the time, Mike Norton, like, I, I mean, I give him credit because it's an iconic symbol that's been used over and over and over again. But, like, Mike, he just slapped one logo on the other one. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's simple, but, I mean, it's just, it was effectively done. But it's done. one of those things that, it's, it's brilliant because, like, no one had done it before, but it seems so obvious. Right. You right. know, that's yeah. the brilliance of it. So, so that was Battle Pug Mike Norton that did yeah. that. Yeah, that's I didn't know that. I didn't know that he was doing that stuff for you guys. Yeah, he was uh, uh lead designer at the time. Okay. I can nice. from this, we sold so many of the the big phone book collection of them just based on that logo being the cover. <laughs> yeah, that was the attraction on that book, and people would come back like, "Wow, that was really cool," and all it took was just the one on the other. <laughs> Like the nerd McDonald's logo, you know, you yeah. can't resist it. <laughs> so you had the the Devils Do crossover GI Joe Transformers book come out roughly at the same time that the Dreamwave book did. Did you it, did the two companies have any coordination of what you guys were doing as a story, trying not to overlap? Um, books are very, very different and, and, and both pretty enjoyable, but what, what did that process look like? Did, did Pat Lee drive his RX-7 over to Chicago oh, and, and take the owner of Devil's Dune and say, we're going to have a talk yes. in this car? <laughs> and, and he keeps hitting all these speed bumps and potholes along the way. Awesome. Uh, so, I mean, there was coordination, but because the two books were so vastly different, uh, they were running congruently. Um and I, I remember, like, how psyched I was that we were sending them comps and they were sending us comps as it was going. And I was like, like, yeah, man, free books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surrounded by comics, free comics, and then I get free comics. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> That's cool that you guys, like, actually collaborated a little bit, you know, to at least stay yeah. on the right path. And I, overlap. I thought it was a tragedy when uh, when Dreamwave imploded because their second volume was what everybody wanted to see. Like, that's that's the Joe Transformer book that I wanted. Like, it was like pure '80s, and like that first issue, just like it was a love letter, and absolutely, I, I loved it, and like stared at the second issue cover so much, and then never saw the second issue. Yes. <sighs> Was it was it Devil's Do side or Dreamwave side that did that image of Baroness with Ravage? That was us. Uh, yeah, yeah. Was, again <laughs> with the awesome iconic, statues, <laughs> iconic image right there of just Baroness holding Ravage on that leash of just like they even made that into a toy for that yeah. San Diego Comic Con mm-hmm. uh, that was set. Cool. Uh, so I <clears throat> I have a story about that issue, um, but then also just to touch we. We were contacted for a while by the uh, company that does statues, the uh, Palisades at the time, was it, or was it Diamond Select? So both of them were doing uh, statues, but this is a company. It's called like First First Four, four Figures. Yeah. Yes. So that they sent us turnarounds. They had turnarounds of uh, like one of our Destro statue or statues, uh, one of our Destro covers uh, as a statue holding like Cobra Commander's hood. Um, they sent us one of a character Wraith that we created. From yeah. One of Covers where he's like bent over and has the blade out. It was like blowing our minds. You're like, this is so great that you're doing these <laughs> covers. And then just like they ghosted on us completely. And I have no idea why. Um, but one of the one of the statues they were gonna do was the Baroness and Ravage together. And I still have turned around. I, I want to say that was solicited and it just never happened. Is it, that yeah, it might have been. Yeah. yeah. And so that cover was actually uh, Mike Norton as well. He drew that cover. Um so that cover was intended to be our uh, Transformers Collector Club convention, whatever it was called at the time. That was going to be our cover for our Joe versus Transformer book that we were going to sell there. Um, it was on issue two. And then when we got our books in, and I think Hasbro got their comps, they messaged us and said, pulp the run. Like, you cannot sell these because the back cover uh, had an image of one of our books called core and it just had a very busty character as the focus. And they're like, no, and I, I wasn't the publisher at the time. So I didn't, I didn't know where the mix up was. Uh, I was, I was there, like I was working in the, uh, the web store and doing all that. So like, I was like, Oh, that's a shame. Um, but a couple of those books survived. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so that as they often do. <laughs> and then, I mean, the comps that were at Hasbro. I don't know if anybody at Hasbro realized how how valuable they made those books when they ordered them pulped, but uh, all their comps just shot up in crazy value. Um, but that cover uh, came out. We just we pulped that and just pressed it on our issue three that was already at the printer. So we were able to have a, a book there at the convention that year. I feel like if I if I jump up from my computer for a minute, I could probably find the book and show you the front and back of it. <laughs> I'll do that a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. We get nice. if you need to take a, a bio break or some at something <laughs> at some point. Um, that's fascinating. Yeah, that doesn't happen all the time, right? That's that's yeah. like some all that stuff Cal- we just paid Cal- for. Fuck stuff. it. Yeah, that just doesn't happen. <laughs> and I I feel like there's only two two ways it could have happened. Either they didn't pay attention or the approvals weren't sent in properly like mm-hmm. maybe they didn't see what ad was going to be on there or maybe it switched at the last minute or again like they could have just not paid attention to the back cover when they got it for approvals yeah so you mentioned earlier sam that you you kind of wiped your brain of all the numbers stuff and you just remember the good times what were some of the standout moments for you working on uh working at devil's do i mean the the conventions are always the best you know like actually getting to hang out with the fans and like that's when all the appreciation shows up versus <laughs> all the bile that's on <laughs> the internet where everybody's just like so hateful and it could be the exact same people i don't know you know but like the conventions are the best part and uh getting you know just getting to hang out with uncle larry a few times yeah. um that's i mean He's he's just a trip, and like if you ever go to dinner dinner with him, he's the only person that should ever talk because he's the one with the stories. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I love JoeCon too. Like again, like I'm a huge Joe fan, so like going every year and setting up and like showing support for the book and and showing the fans that like yeah, like we're fans too. Like we're here because we're nerds, not here to make money, but also we're making some money. So that's great. You know, I don't know. As a Joe fan, like just getting to work on the brand was, you know, the highlight. What was your take on you? You were there during the the Joe versus Transformer stuff, right? I mean, you you've alluded yeah. to that already. Uh, I came in on the first volume. I think I started around like issue three or four of the first volume, and uh, I. I was a little, it was a little hard for me to stomach just like seeing characters die and like took me a minute to realize like you don't have to give a fuck what's going on in a book. Like you can just <laughs> go for the ride and enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And, like you, you can go home and your iron eyed from the movie can still be alive, man. Like <laughs> in the movie. I remember having, like consoling my uh, my wife's little sister, you know, she was like, so iron head was my favorite and they killed him. I'm like, you can, you can buy the toy. You can still hang out with them. Like <laughs> dead, dead. <laughs> well, it's it's kind of like when Hasbro uh, closed the funding on that Razor Crest, and then the next night on Mandalorian, <laughs> they destroyed the ship. <laughs> <laughs> if if they had waited twenty four more hours, they would have, <laughs> would have not been funded. <laughs> has that has that been public? Like saying like they knew the timing on that. They had to. They had There's to no way they would have been like, "You're gonna what?" We gotta get this thing out! Oh my god, it takes 48 days! We gotta get a fucking fuck! <laughs> so they, I mean, that's how I imagine it in the Hasbro office. The day they find out that thing's getting destroyed, they're like, Oh no! <laughs> Six months of development, down the shitter, let's go! <laughs> uh, I do remember uh, coming in when uh, and and the huge thing was getting to see the the books before they went to press and like just kind of looking at them at like correction stages and being an intern like I shouldn't have been anywhere near that stuff uh, but they were like hey you like GI Joe check us out and then doing the complete worst thing that I could have done after they showed me that and been like oh well why is reflector colored like a Constructicon like what is this and they're like you little asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there is like a trailbreaker that showed up after trailbreaker was killed in the first volume. And I was like, why is this guy here? And they're like, man, shut up. Dude. What are you, an editor? <laughs> <laughs> like, I said it. somebody was in charge of continuity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what were uh, some of the stories you wrote while you were there? Oh, so 
having this weird encyclopedic like knowledge of the Joe stuff, uh, they would lean heavy on me for any of the bios. Uh, the first time I got to pen a bio was uh, when we collected the um, ooh, Master and Apprentice series that Brandon Jerwood did. It was our first uh, uh, little mini series about the um, the ninja side of it, and he was. I think Brandon would have done it, but he was moving on to another gig that we had ready for him. So whoever, whatever characters that we had in that book, they wanted to put like some bios in the back of the trade paperback. So I did those, uh, which led to me doing like any time we had bios, it was me and the editor, Michael Sullivan. We would sit down and do the bios for um, all the Joe characters. And we released actual bio books after a while, like the data desk handbook. It was just like bio after bio. And it was, that was that, Part. I love that kind of stuff. Those are always so rad. <laughs> like sitting there, yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 Mike's a, a monster at that stuff. Like, you know, he'll do the research. You know, I'm going off off memory and then like looking at file cards and like looking online to see like what comic I should look in for key moments to, to write these bios. But then like I turn into Mike and he's like, nope, nope, this happened. You can't do that. I'm like, oh, cool, we're good. Um, yeah. So that stuff was that stuff was pretty great. Um, and then. I think the the main like full book I wrote was one of the special mission books that we did. Oh, uh, nice. We were, I think it was maybe issue six of the special mission series, but they were all based on locales for the most part. Like we did Tokyo and Antarctica. Uh, so the Brazil one was mine. Nice. And that was me just like every time they're like pitching a new special mission. I'm like, how are we not done Brazil yet? Like that's <laughs> one that needs to be done. And like it was already written, like my characters were picked out. And I was like, it's it's writing itself, you guys. Um, which which bugged me. If if you go back and look at that, uh, uh, the the cover to it is shipwreck and cover girl uh, on the cover, and that was the eight page backup story in the back that our editor Mike wrote. And because he's the editor, he's like, oh, well, my my. <laughs> the story's getting on the cover. Like, okay, cool. I well, I control the print runs and our our special covers, so I did a, a web store cover with my characters on it, and I was like, well, mine's gonna be sought after. And <laughs> so, cool, so that's a that's a pretty storied spot in GI Joe lore is to write the file cards because Larry Hama wrote the majority of them, but like what Stephen King even wrote one for Crystal Ball, correct? The the, the Cobra Kai. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so you're like Larry Hama, Stephen King, and, and Sam are the, uh, the writers of the, the Joe file cards here. Yeah. And I love that, like, how much time that I spent with Larry. Uh, I've tried to walk in his footsteps, at least for that stuff. And then now, literally, if I walked up to him, he'd be like, oh, nice to meet you. Like, cool. Like, he'd have <laughs> absolutely no idea who the hell I am. Aww. I did get this sh- uh, at the last Joe Con, um, Chattanooga, I think it was 2018. He was there signing, and uh, I stood in line, like because he doesn't know who the fuck I am now. And uh, I walk up there, and I showed him uh, the trade paperback for the Storm Shadow series that we did. Uh, phenomenal series, like Larry wrote it, and like the art was like so far removed from anything that we'd done in Joe. And it was like one of the smartest books we'd ever done. Um, and I showed him how I approved the spine that says Larry Hama with uh, one R in Larry. Oh no. <laughs> And I, I apologize for it. And he's like, "Oh, I never, I never knew that uh, that happened." Okay. And I was like, "Fuck!" Like I didn't have to bring it up to you. <laughs> I didn't have to apologize because you never do. <laughs> Such yeah. an artist, pointing out your own flaws where Aww. people don't even see them. But the the best part is that Larry Larry joked me on my, on the signature. He signed it, Larry Hama, and then did the S I C. The little I found it. <laughs> And like I walked away looking at it, I was like that is so good. Like he totally got me, man. <laughs> that is cool. Satisfying for you though, uh, seeing a character like Wraith get a 25th anniversary figure in that line. Like really, what you guys were doing, getting legitimized in in this toy rebranding that was happening at that. Point. And I don't know, just must have been such a, a real legitimizing feeling for you. Yeah. No. Anytime one of the characters came out in, in plastic form, I mean, for oh, me, especially just to be like, hey, <laughs> I need that. Uh, I, and, I, and just all the even all the merchandise that has come out of the crossover stuff. 
Yeah. Like there was the first four figures, Optimus and was it Storm Shadow? I have that piece. The the Cobra Con logo that's been used on I don't know how many actual toys at this point, not just fan club figures. You know, uh, the Serpentor that they did for the TF Club, which is super rad. He's hanging out. I forgot that was a double two. Isn't he? So sick. He's such a little loose figure, man. That (laughs) he likes to fall. Yeah. Yeah. The um, one thing I wish they had done that they, they, they never did was the was it the Optimus is a hiss tank? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I wanted that like, so the, bad. <laughs> the Night Raven Transformers in the first yeah. series. Like oh, yeah. there's such a big well to pull from. The the Not trouble the bubbles, the, the, the transformers that turned into the trouble bubbles, the hiss tanks, the uh what was the motorcycle that split in the, the fronts uh had the two little pods? It's done. The stun, yeah, the stun cycle, like because you had, you guys said Autobots had turned into those, right? Uh, I, I think so. I, I don't okay. remember. Now, but, yeah. Man, yeah, that Starscream piloted by Cobra Commander. I mean, it just doesn't doesn't get better than that. Like, yeah, <laughs> that, that, was, that, that was there's that one Diego piece of art where he's point, sliding, right? he's sliding down. Uh, uh, you know, he just transformed. It's so awesome. That was all devils do, man. Like you guys yeah. did did that thing. So right, yeah, and Dreamwave yeah. started off like... so wrong with that World War One <laughs> shit. Like, oh yeah. my god, it was yeah. so bad. Was not... And the worst part is, I love Jay Lee, but like, whoever was coloring his stuff, just it was. It was like oh, that Game cool. of Thrones episode. You couldn't see what was going on. Yes, <laughs> I feel like Very every dark. time it came back, every time it came back to their editor, they were probably like muddier, muddier. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can tell I mean... who that is. It's a cool stylistic choice. It just, it just wasn't what we wanted, you know. Like for the first, like here's GI Joe versus Transformers in comics back in World War One. No, we want it in the '80s, dude. Uh, yeah, there was some fun design stuff out of there. It was neat, neat to see the two different crossovers at two different time periods. So yeah. there was some contrast that I enjoyed. It was just, it was really just the color, the coloring, and how muddy it all was. Got it. What's that? Our the yeah. uh, second volume. Uh, our second volume, they actually do all the time travel in. Yeah. I feel like mm-hmm. that was a missed opportunity on Devil's Do's part. We should have like done a little quick nod, like a few pages into the World War II stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah, some of the designs senior year of college. were so good. Go senior year of college, having both the, the Dreamwave and the Devil's Do crossover posters on my... Uh, my my college room wall and uh yeah i, I, I didn't meet a lot of ladies that year <laughs> i was gonna say i must have gotten all the ladies with that right damn yeah. <laughs> well yeah that, those those further the, the time travel um series was cool because all the transformers get redesigned you know like every time they redesign them in the comics like that's like eye candy you know like oh what does he turn into like (laughs) was jazz turned like into a limo or something it it was really cool i think he was a little something yeah he yeah it was because they were in the 70s or something but (laughs) yeah all those were so cool yeah that second series was not the best though It, it seemed pretty rushed uh, even from inside the company, you know, hmm. I feel like it, it, it might have meant to have been a longer series, and we just kind of wrapped it up quicker. And I don't, I don't know if that was a sales thing or if that was some sort of directive from Hasbro, hmm. but I don't know. It just ultimately seemed kind of rushed to me. And the fact that you're jumping from timeline to timeline, it's it's kind of hard to like keep track of what the hell's going on. You, know? you kind of touched on this, and maybe. The answer is the same as before, but like, so you did Hasbro have to approve any of these, you know, visual changes to the characters and stuff at that time, or were they just like, it looks cool, great? I mean, they had to approve it, but it was a very uh, loose and hand wavy. Yeah, yeah. Again, like it, it's a universe that doesn't really matter, you know, because they yeah they did well they didn't make toys of it either, so it's yeah. like they you know they're really not concerned yeah and that's that's the uh the pinup that fall the other day in the shop when you came in if you want me to show that off i i have it here i don't know if it's oh well yeah what did, um before you just show it like give us some give us some info and what i if i remember correctly there was kind of more 
Transformers vs. G.I. Joe materials created that just kind of didn't make it out of the license. Was lo- I'm not really sure what the situation was, but you you basically have a few of those uh, so maybe the, looking at for the first time. The, the first bit is... Um, this one is because of that second series uh, where we were mashing everybody up together. Um, I'm pretty sure this is from the second series, even though it just says Joe versus Transformers in the corner. Uh, it's a pinup that was never finished. Uh, this was done by Tim Seeley, who was at the time our in-house staff artist. Uh, and I don't know how well it's going to turn up on screen. I'm going to angle it if I can. Uh, so that's Zartan and a bunch of oh, rec- junkions. Yeah, Rec Bar's hanging out there, and then yeah, there's there's some other junk yams you can see. And and the thing that I realized pulling oh this out uh, recently is that I can just go to Tim's house and have him finish this. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he's, like, like it, like he's already done the layout. He probably had no problem just like finishing it off for me. <laughs> yeah. Every time you hang out with Tim Seeley, do you have to drink zombie dust? Yeah, no, it's in his his contract with. Three Floyds. <laughs> so, yeah, the guy, for those of you don't, who don't know, Tim Seeley, who was the artist and, and did a ton of work and in writing on some of the G.I. Joe books, did the uh, the artwork for the Zombie Dust Three Floyds uh, uh, packaging. Ah, oh, did not know that. Now, that's yeah. literally like when I'm, when I'm boasting about him to any friend, it's like not the comic shit. It's like, whoa, he did the beer label? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it helps that the beer is good. Yeah, no, it's so good. It's got to be something, though, at an image with um, Zartan and Rekgar, and all you can hear is Cold Slither on Headbanger's Ball. <laughs> like, that has to be the only thing playing there. <laughs> uh, uh, Paul, this is just for you, so everybody don't listen. Uh, I was walking through Humboldt Park the other day, <laughs> and uh, I saw a sticker, like, just slapped somewhere that was, it said Cold Slither. And I was like, what the hell? Really? Yeah. And it wasn't that's like goat branded at all. It just said Cold Slither. And I was like, oh, that's weird. That's great. Um, Punk's not dead. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's still putting up slappers. It's probably Sergio. <laughs> <laughs> Rolling through my hood. It had to be a busty anime girl for it to be Sergio. Yeah. <laughs> Something a little weebier. <laughs> But Tim actually uh, did most of the Joe Transformer stuff for us after the first series. Uh, Tim, uh, I think he had a hand in the story of the second one, but he did most of the art throughout that one, if not all of it. And then he wrote our third volume, and he wrote our fourth volume. Uh, the fourth volume, which was just two double-sized, double-sized issues at that point. And that was one, the last one was more with like Unicron and... Yeah, Cobra Law. Cobra Law, right? Yeah, so mm-hmm. it got really crazy. That's that's when you can really tell that Hasbro didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> Surprised he never did a hack slash crossover. <laughs> yeah. well, they, they care when that stuff happens. As soon as the boobs happen. Oh, right. That's right. Oh, boobs. Kids brand. <laughs> yeah. No Memories don't guns. exist. But, like, the fact that you, you see Battle Beasts and, like, the aliens from G.I. Joe hanging out inside of Unicron, like, that... That was such a, like, go crazy, Tim. Do whatever. Just draw stuff. <laughs> well, um, when did... I'm, I'm sure there's still plenty more to talk about, and we can circle back, however, especially TJ and Nick. I think you guys probably have some more industry questions to jam on. But um, how, did, how did your time kind of come to a close with, with Devils Do, and what is the current status of the company? Uh, so, I mean... I don't know outside of Josh what Devils Do is. Uh, I know he's always got people working for him, and like he runs the company more as a freelance basis. Um, but I I was there till 2010, um, and I was the la- I feel like I was the last employee. Uh, so like my my toe was on that ship like last last bit of, that I could. Uh, so I, I had to jump into a lot of roles. Uh, which I am super thankful for now, but like when the company's dwindling because like the Joe brand's gone and we're we're just not picking up licenses, it's kind of an awkward situation to be like, 
oh, bye, friends that, like, I never hang out with outside of this, but now I'm going to do your job. Like, I'm going to edit stuff. I'm going to design stuff. I'm going to build the books now. I'm going to build our solicitation ads. Like, that's that sort of stuff. Like, I appreciate getting the, the experience of doing that because, like, I use that sort of stuff all the time now. Um, but I, I think the last, like, I, I could see the end <laughs> was near when uh, we start digitizing everything for Comixology and, like, we weren't really putting out any new books. And I was like, well, there's a finite number of books in our library. And, like, when they're all digitized for Comixology, like, what am, what am I doing here, you know? Uh, but that was... It's it's all fluid and led me to exactly where I am right now with, with the shop, with Toy Du Jour. Um, because at Devil's Do... Which uh, we absolutely love, by the way. Thanks. Love that shop. <laughs> thanks. Actually, yeah, we were going to get there, for sure. <laughs> so we weren't trying to hide it. <laughs> the, the, the name Toy Du Jour actually came from me sitting in my assistant publisher cubicle because it looks a lot like this and I'd bring in toys like literally every day. Yeah, you have those cubes that are like little half height walls that people can walk by and like bother you. Uh, and I would have toys all over that. And people would come up every day and they'd be like, oh, what's the toy of the day? I'm like, oh, yeah, here you go. Uh, so that, there you go. <laughs> that kind of spiraled into like when I when uh, as all toy nerds do, I was like, oh, I need a toy blog. You know, like so I was like, OK. And I did that and called it Toy Du Jour just based off of the experience of hanging out with everybody and like, messing with toys every day. Uh, <laughs> And because I had that URL, when we went to open the shop, I was like, let's just, like, we've already built, like, a weird following online with this. Let's just push it into the shop, you know? Very cool. <laughs> and I feel like I can uh, draw a straighter line. <laughs> um, because we worked with Hasbro so closely on Joe and Transformers and uh, Micronauts, um, we we had that relationship there that we spun off a little creative services company at Devil's Do, uh, and we started doing a lot of packaging for for Hasbro, um, and that's also because they knew that we had the artists to fall back on. Uh, I think that might be how Jeff got the Action Man gig, if I remember right. You, you, do you know Jeff Zorno? Uh, I I don't he know. He did him. Halloween with you guys, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I, I don't know him personally, but uh, that's probably. Through that company, that company no longer exists, but it was called Kanoichi, mm. uh, and so Kanoichi was just kind of a small little satellite studio for Devil's Due, which eventually broke off completely. Um, there was some bad blood there between Josh and the president of Kanoichi, um, and then after a year, when I left uh, Devil's Due, sometime near the end of 2010, they reached out and they're like, "Hey, do you want to come work in Kanoichi?" And I'm like, "Hell yeah, man! Like you guys are working with Hasbro on the regular. Like Hasbro was like." You know, she's bread and butter. So I was like, sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I was at Kinoichi. Uh, that company was like just the owner and then like four creative managers uh, that just were overseeing projects. Uh, so we got to do all sorts of packaging stuff for Hasbro, like including the 25th anniversary Joe line. Most of those like card recreations were us. And oh. there's, there's some there's some not some great ones in there <laughs> that I wish could have been redone. Uh um, but we also did a lot of those Joe versus Transformer crossover, uh, like the big box sets. The San Diego stuff, yeah. yeah. Oh my those god, awesome. those are amazing. <laughs> we did those. Um, we did. Oh, I'm gonna look through some more art real quick. We did. Um, any anytime there was like a Joe exclusive at a show, like the uh, the Lady. Oh, that that actually didn't happen. So there was a Lady J that was gonna come out at the time of the movie the Lady J figure from the second movie was going to be uh, an exclusive. So we did all this exclusive art for her. And then they were, they were like, oh, we're just going to fold her onto the main line and not do her as an exclusive. Uh, but... Yeah. Uh, here's a couple pieces of art that I got from uh, Chris Lee that worked for us for a while. And he was doing the, some of the Joe versus, or sorry, some of the 25th anniversary stuff. Uh, so that's Tunnel Rat there. Oh, nice. And Shockwave. Uh, so I messaged nice. him and I was like, hey, I know you did the Tunnel Rat. Can I buy that from you? And he's like, yeah, but I'm sorry, I drew it on the same page as Shockwave. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's absolutely okay. Oh, no, <laughs> I have to get both. <laughs> the SWAT Team G.I. Joe guy that looks like Beachhead but with blue and a hat? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Try, 
trying to find that other one. Oh, man. Where'd that one go? Uh, oh, yeah. This one. This was the uh, San Diego Comic-Con Jinx. This was the... I think this was the back image for the card. Oh. This was one of our... Uh, this was one of Devil's Deuce's interns that, like, just apparently blew our mind that he could draw, like, bonkers. And wow. so we used to always hire him at Kanoichi just to do this artwork stuff. Hmm. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, so that um, that small company, we, we did so much stuff for Hasbro, and we were doing a lot of the packaging art, and then we would work a lot of uh, pitch decks for them. So anytime they were, like, working on an internal pitch... Uh, we we would put the decks together with them, and we would let them like ramble about like uh, <laughs> like feelings and like <laughs> colored templates, and like we'd just be like, all right, take that and regurgitate it back to them, and like change it twenty times, and then like literally get emails saying like, hey, I'm on the way to the meeting. Can you change these four things in the next five minutes and have it email? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so that that stuff was pretty great. Um, that company. Uh, the the president got a job at a digital agency downtown Chicago, and after he was hired, uh, he let it slip that he owned this company. And they're like, "Oh, well, we want we want that too." <laughs> He's like, oh, "Okay." So all four of us were just uh, brought on to this much larger company out of nowhere, wow. uh, and it was mainly because that company wanted to like add that little Hasbro logo to their client list on their website. You know, like when any agency you look at all their people they worked with you're like yeah yeah we want that and uh, so we went there i stuck with the hasbro stuff but like all of a sudden my my big projects of like doing packaging for the san diego comic-con crossovers they're like what is that like that's not that's not worth our time i was like oh that's because that's that's the fun stuff you know yeah. oh, that's what i signed up for bro <laughs> yeah i'm and here like, to make the nerds go man that's awesome <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so they I, they that company pushed us a little more towards like we started doing um, integrated app stuff for Hasbro. We were working a lot with their like future development team at Hasbro, like what, what they're looking at like forward in the future, like toys, like what they're gonna do. Mm -hmm. So we were doing that. We did a lot of apps. We did like the Nerf Rebel app. We did the first uh, heads up display app for Nerf. Um, sure. We did a big Furby Boom website that year that Furby Boom was a thing for Christmas. Uh, and then I started seeing less and less of the Hasbro work come through and like more and more of like other clients like Culligan Water and Motorola. And I was like, what is this? Like I started as Devil's Due because I liked G.I. Joe and now I'm getting yelled at for like a $20,000 discrepancy at Culligan. Like I, I don't, this is not what I want. And that's uh, where the store came from. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you've always been into. I mean, clearly, we've talked a lot about comics, but you were kind of into toys the whole time. Yeah, no, forever. Was, yeah, <laughs> that was that was the con I was running there. Like, <laughs> I'm here for the toys. Yeah, like the the good old days at the beginning when I started Hasbro, and they would send us boxes and boxes of stuff, and I'm like, oh my god, this is the best. And then by the time that Wraith came out that you mentioned, uh, yeah, I was I remember being at Kohl's like hunting for it because I heard that like he'd shown up at Kohl's. It's like, all right, this is what I got to do now. <laughs> that well had dried up. So, um, maybe tell us about the store. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I have not been Chicago. to the new location yet. So, how's that all working out? Uh, pretty good. In regards to comics, do you feel that there was anything on Joe that you didn't get to do that you wish you had. It's good. Oh, <laughs> um, it was a loaded gun question, but it's good yeah. One. yeah. Yeah. So this one was, this one was kind of strange. Um, as much as like, I was like bruised by IDW when they got the, the license and like, I was the only one still in the office buying it. <laughs> I'd buy it and be like, hey, guys, check this out. And they're like, dude, shut up. I'm like, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, after a while, I, I dropped the book myself because, you know, it was it was just, like, kind of a sore thing, even though the Cobra series was amazing, like the Chuckles thing. Couldn't. Oh, couldn't wow. So good. Yeah, couldn't couldn't not read that one. That was crazy. Um, <laughs> um, 
so before we lost the license, and I think it was literally the day that like Josh got the phone call, and like maybe literally had hung up the phone. Uh, Mike, my editor, and I walked into his office, and I was like, "Hey, we have an idea for a book, and uh, I think we should reach out to uh, someone at Hasbro to, to write it for us. Uh, let's do a cartoon continuity." And he's like, uh, "Not now." <laughs> I was like, "Oh, okay." Oh. And so, like, what was that? Like two, three weeks ago, when they announced their new cartoon continuity book. I mean, I don't know if it's going to make it out or like what the actual state of things is, you know, at IDW or if, if the license is going to continue on. But if that book comes out, that one, that one hurts because that that was something that like we were going to like, you know, that was a, that was a baby we were going to bring in to this world. And I thought like. That's what a lot of people want to see. Like, you know, that would bring more people into the Joe world or the Joe comic world, because if all they knew was the cartoon, this is a safer way to like get your feet wet. You know? Would you have ignored the Sunbow stuff or uh, use that? Ooh. I feel like that. That's. <laughs> I, I feel like that's stuff you would uh, ignore, as far as like the continuity, but you could work it in. You know, you could work in characters, you could work in designs, but you don't have to. Like, you can pick up right after the movie, like IDW, I, I believe, is doing. Um, shoot. Oh, <laughs> yeah, there was, there was one time that I... Uh, I So there's there's an error in the special issue, special missions issue that I wrote uh, where uh, somebody is called by the wrong name, and that's always bugged me because, like, that's something that I messed up and then our editor missed completely. And then when the, uh, the books were getting reprinted at IDW... I emailed Chris and like, hey, Chris, if you guys reprint this special missions issue that I did, can you change this one error that I did? Uh, the, the one error? <laughs> can, you, can you fix this, this little name thing? And he wrote back and he's like, yeah, we're not going to reprint that. I'm like, oh, okay. No problem. No problem. So, so your store, you know, you've got uh, Toy Du Jour now. I, I've been there a few times. I've bought stuff from there. I've sold stuff to you. Um, w- what's it like being a toy store owner uh, in this day and age? Yeah. Uh, so we started. So, to- forget yeah. the last two years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, no, like, I want to hear what it's like <laughs> even in the last, especially the last two years. I'm, I'm really curious what that what that experience is like, especially the juxtaposition. You know what? There's a there's a TV show out that you can just go and watch. Like, you oh know, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we started in 2014. Uh, my wife kept her nine to five up until this past year. Uh, the plan had always been for her eventually to like quit her nine to five and, and join me at the shop. That's so uh, cool. Yeah. So so we started at a much smaller location. I don't know if you've ever been to the, the original location because I, I know you've been to the current location. But yeah, I haven't been to the original. Yeah. So I mean, I'm in the suburbs. It's it's a pain in the butt to get in the city. Grant and I went to the first time I went there was for the Voltron. The art show. Yeah, the Voltron event. Yeah, and that that event is a good example. Our shop is so small, and that show is so big that I rented out our neighbor's uh, apartment, uh, literally next door, uh, to have spillover for uh, more of the art and like you know patrons to come in. Um, The the next door was also a storefront, but it was a girl that was just like living there in the storefront, and she was totally cool with just setting up artwork in her house and letting people in, which was pretty well, great. Actually, well, I had, thought there was a dance studio or something. Uh, so she was going to, and I don't think it was she was allowed to, but it was supposed to be like a hair salon that she was also living in. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so our old space was tiny i don't i i mean it, it was compact like there was a lot of stuff crammed in this very very small space and i, I mean it worked for us like it worked for us for uh like six years because right at the beginning of the pandemic um 2020 january we opened up in a space that's three times the size as our original location which means three times the rent and uh and then the world ended promptly like right right when we were like yeah, let's take this huge risk. Let's do it. We've been good for six years. That's and then, right. Yeah, and the world was like, no, 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 there's other things going on. You're you're not going to do that good. <laughs> but, uh, but through that couple years, uh, since 2020, um, like our landlord came to us and he was like, hey, you guys, 
you know, figure out what you can do. Like our landlord's also like a huge toy guy. Like he's a huge collector. That's why we're there. He ordered us to get us into that space, uh, which used to be uh, Logan Records, Logan Hardware Records, whatever. Um, and it hadn't been anything for a couple of years. Uh, so we, yeah, we moved in there. Uh, we got a, we, we suckered a couple people into renting space from us in there too. And like setting up little <laughs> vendor booths. Do we know any of those guys? <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was one guy that I met at, um, no. at like a scalping convention, where it's just like scalpers hang out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> oh, don't it's name called it. hair. It's, it's hair con. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's where you can get your scalps. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, we were we were nervous as shit going into the new space. So like we reached out to some people and like uh, I think Paul was like one of the first two people we asked and Paul was like, Where do I sign? <laughs> Which was a uh, Well yeah, it was I thought it was I was like, Whoa, this is a crazy idea. Let's try this. Why not? Sounds fun. <laughs> Plus I, I I it was it's fun coming into the store like on a regular basis just to kind of like, it's like one of the few social things I have left <laughs> at this point in, uh, you know, two years in. So, and we love uh, every visit. Fun. So yeah, keep coming all the time. It's great. <laughs> Especially when Ripley comes with you. Oh, only when Ripley comes yeah. with you. Well, you had a, only they tolerate me. Yeah, you had a surprise guest today, which was much welcome as well. Oh, yeah. Brought the baby. Oh. <laughs> she was like, she was like, this looks like our basement. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> sensory overload. Yeah. So uh, in general, like besides the uh, landlord, like totally coming to us and helping us out, saying like, you know, don't shoot yourself in the foot. Like set a re- realistic goal and like let's stick with that and work back to a normal uh, rent. Um, that that's, that's super cool of them. That's awesome. Customers have just like been insanely supportive um you know like when everything first went to shit and like nobody knew what to do there were people just like buying gift certificates and i was oh, like oh, wow thank you like <laughs> i can't sell you anything right now but like thanks for buying this you know uh and for the for that time we we utilized it the best we could um our our storage is and usually is uh crazy just like packed because like we'll buy things throw it back there and then try to pull it out and sort it and get it on the floor but we used the the time that we were shut down we pulled everything out of storage and organized it the best we could you know so there's no like random he-man laying in the bottom of a gi joe box you know uh so we we used that to organize and then we also started doing a lot of like instagram sales where it's just like we'll bombard you with like 30 things all at a predetermined time so people can come like, yeah, I was going to say, your social media presence is just killer. I love the Facebook page and seeing all the stuff that comes across, and I'm always so excited to see what you guys post. You Thanks. guys always have the best stuff. <laughs> I have to say that, like, Instagram, like, it, it, it's a huge uh, part of our business, and literally when we opened, uh, one of our friends was in, and she was like, oh, are you getting your Instagram up and going? I'm like, oh, yeah, I think we'll do an Instagram. And now it's like, I couldn't imagine the shop without that that outlet you that's know? awesome that's cool yeah i mean at that point i gotta steal a page out of your book <laughs> yeah, you 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 have like an ungodly amount of posts it's like twenty three thousand. last time i remember looking it's probably way more than that uh yeah, i don't remember how many posts we have um but yeah like i i used to set like a weird like schedule like oh you have to get nine things posted a day and now it's just like if i feel like it i'll post something today you know but I'm still, it's like second nature to me now. Like, it's just easy to just like show off what's going on. But those, those Instagram sales while we were closed down, like, you know, we amped up our eBay stuff too, which it's just, eBay is just the polar opposite because it's so cold and you're dealing with like the most assholes you can think of. <laughs> Where Instagram is literally the, the family you've cultivated. Like these people that like understand you and get your humor and, they know that you're not going to fuck them over, so they're not there looking for anything like, you know, like they don't think you're going to swindle them, you know. And it's it's much better to, like, sell to them. It feels weirdly more honest than having to deal with, like, somebody through <laughs> eBay or whatever other means, you know. Yeah. And then there's still, there's still a few that th- slip through the cracks, though, right? 
<laughs> Once in a while, there's a bad sale. Like, because we we're we're trading war stories all the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think that like of a, a bad one, but that's the that's the thing. I can't like off the top of my head, I can't think of a, a bad story right now from the Instagram. That, that's good because like it's like once you get it, it happens to you. You like talk about it, and then it's like purged from your life. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like you don't want to remember the bad ones. Really pull up an eBay thing right now and just be like, oh, this fucking thing got made back to me for whatever reason. <laughs> You know, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, like when when we were able to slowly open up in different capacities, like we were doing appointment only for a while and like very strict about like our, our amount of people that could come in. Um, you know, people people were really good about it. You know, we had a, a limit of, I think, six people in our massive store, which is well under what we could handle. It's just like I wanted to feel safe and like I wanted the other customers to feel safe. So. We, we set it real low. I think we bumped it to 10 eventually. But, like, people were waiting in line outside. Like, they were, like, cool with it. Like, they'd walk up, see that we hit capacity, and they're like, cool, we'll wait. And, like, that's amazing. Like, yeah. The support of somebody, like, not yelling at you when you're telling them, wait outside in the cold for a minute, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think, Paul, weren't you there the first day that we reopened with appointments or whatever? Or I might have been. Was that the day I was working the door? Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, I th- yeah, I think. Because we just we just didn't know what was gonna happen. Yeah, you know, like were there gonna be twenty people waiting? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want that black Eric so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? I mean, right. come on. Paul just teases all. That's. Of us. I think that was one of the things I yeah. sold you when I was there that time. Was the gigantic action? Was it black Zarek or Scorpionok or both? No, you, no, I haven't I've ever. I don't own that. No, no, no. Uh, to Sam, when I was the last time I was at Toy Du Jour, I had sold you. You don't, probably don't remember. <laughs> was it the uh, um... the gigantic action by Sentinel? I forget if yeah. it was Black Zarek or Scorpionok. I, yeah, whichever one it was, uh, I can tell you our current landlord owns that. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. This is like here's our rent for the month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was. That was the other side of it that, like, moving into his face, I was like, well, this is easy. Like, he pays a third of our rent now, who, you know, of course. And then, like, <laughs> the pandemic happened. He was, like, super cool about it. But then he was also like, and I'm pulling back on buying anything. I'm like, oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> Double win. How long did he stick with that? Uh, I think he, he started back in when the Master of the Universe origin started. Like, that was too good for him to, like, to <laughs> ignore. But there's already two, like, some. He's told me there's so many things that like he's missed that like it just hurts for him to go back and try to like start hunting this stuff down now, you know. Oh, like, he'll, I, he'll be back. You you know how toy collectors are. They yeah. That that bug is a permanent bite. <laughs> yeah. So how did um, what what did you learn at Devils Do that you like apply to running the toy store? <laughs> Uh, like all that stuff you said you wanted to forget pretty much or where there is there like something applicable that's like no, absolutely how how to run a business on zero dollars is what I, I learned and like it, it has helped immensely in in a business of my own you know just like realizing that like there's so many things that people think you need to run a business or like when you're presenting yourself in some way shape or form it's like like showing up to a convention, it's like you need to buy all these things from from Freeman. It's like oh, you don't though. Like I know you don't. Like I I know <laughs> that I can go to Home Depot and buy some carpeting today and like lay it down myself. Like we're good. Yeah. But like every aspect of it, like I I know how to go like find the cheapest flyers, find the cheapest stickers, like find the cheapest bags. Like it's that <laughs> that was that was a good boot camp for. <laughs> running your own your own business yeah. yeah and you guys use that a lot like you have all sorts of self-promotional like fun things that you're changing all the time like branding wise like oh, that, you, pins and pins and stickers you always have a new sticker yeah <laughs> and some people overlook that you know but like your stuff it's it's just fun and interesting yeah i mean we try to do that as much as we can but that's also just me wanting to have fun like literally me yeah. like hey i want to make a transformer logo like, let's do it you know i think the the best or my favorite one is the one that kind of stuck is when we for halloween one year went as toys r us <laughs> we redid all of our branding uh it said toy du jour but it was written like toys, toys r us font. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, like we made pins of that, stickers of that. We we literally covered our sign outside the building with that sign, and uh, all got shirts to look like the Toys R Us shirts. Uh, <laughs> and we still kept that. Like it's brilliant you Instagram icon. It's still the little star with the DE from Toy Du Jour. That's good. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, looking back, like all that stuff, like just like the have fun part and like know how to do it on the cheap, you know. Yeah, immensely helpful. So would, I don't know what, like, I'm trying to think of the equivalent for help. You might need to help me, Nick, but, like, do you have a complete run of the G.I. Joe figures behind you? Or are there still oh. pieces you're missing? Yeah, so my my method originally was just check the figure off on a list and move on. I didn't care about condition, completeness, or whatever. Um so that, that led me to now, like, to this day, if you look at, like, some later 90s figures, there'll be, like, a helmet or something missing here and there. Um, and that's the great part of the shop is that, like, as soon as something comes in, I'm cherry-picking anything <laughs> that comes through. Uh, like, upgrading a figure, but then also, like, if there's something missing from my stuff. And this display specifically is from 82 to the end of the 94 line down there. Yeah, and then, I mean I've said that before, but like the shop is just literally a front for a front for us to like cherry pick the best stuff. To collect, yeah. I mean, hey, <laughs> executive privilege. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just having that stuff come in, and even if it's like a crazy piece that like I don't feel like I can afford personally, it's like this is the cheapest way you're ever going to get to buy this. Yes. Oh yeah, you need to <laughs> awesome. Stop worrying about that, and maybe sell the next one that comes through. <laughs> Well, you I, mean, I just finished my MicroMasters today. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. What are some of the crazier pieces you've gotten in the store? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Oh, uh, we've gotten a lot of the Grail stuff now. That like, I'm kind of checking off Grails. Um, not so much for me, but just having them come through the shop. You know, uh, I did get to upgrade my Fort Max when a better Fort Max came through within the last like two years. Um, we have had uh, a Wonder Brand He Man come through, which just it's the only one that I've ever seen in person. So that was pretty great. Uh, the person that bought that from us had actually, like, maybe a month prior, bought a custom of that that I made myself. Like, we, had, <laughs> we had a beater He Man in the shop, and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to paint him up like one dar and throw him in the case for 40 bucks. And then, like, literally the same guy came in. He's like, oh, man. I was like, oh, do I need to give you $40 off of this because you bought that custom? You summoned it. You willed <laughs> it into existence walking into the shop. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we, we've had a few flags. Um, we've only ever had one flag displayed, and that's at this shop because the previous shop, we couldn't fit it in there. Like, it was so small. <laughs> that I, The two flags that we sold out of the last shop uh, they were never displayed. It was just like, hey, I have a flag in the back. If you want it, I'll bring the pieces out, throw them in your car. Like That's that's how those were sold. Um, we've had a Defiant, a G.I. Joe Defiant. Um, oh, wow. I had the Eternia <laughs> set, right? Yeah. I don't know if that's yeah. on the same level, but, yeah. but, you know. Yeah, well, we currently have that's Eternia in the shop that I've, I've been ignoring. Like We've had a piece of it before, but we have a pretty good chunk of attorney in now that I'm, I'm trying to find the box of all the parts that I misplaced already in the back somewhere. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't know. We've got, we've, we've had some prototypes come through uh, again, like the Hasbro connections um, kind of lead to us every now and then getting some cooler stuff. Like we've gotten a lot of green tag stuff before from some mm -hmm. of my Hasbro contacts. Um, uh, I know when we opened uh, one of our, Hasbro friends sent us a Marvel Legend of, is it Phoenix Saga, Cyclops? It was it was a oh group. oh Phoenix Five Cyclops. Yeah, yeah. Holy cow! They sent us that the the one that was shown I think at like a, a toy fair or something, and they're like, hey, we don't know if this is gonna ever come out, and it still hasn't. Like they sent us that no. like years ago. Yes. Uh, they're like, we don't know if this is ever gonna come out, so if you're gonna sell it, put it on eBay like immediately. Holy mackerel. And we did. Like, we were like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's that, gone. That figure uh, paid our rent uh, one of those first months, which was great. Um, yeah, I mean, just 
personally, like getting to fill holes in the old uh, G1 stuff, uh, my, my G1 collection's pretty similar to this. It's just over there in a different case. Um, so I, I harder I to get it all on camera. <laughs> Uh, I pick away at that as much as I can because uh, I was a lot more loose on that than I was on my Joe stuff originally. Um, but yeah, yeah, just just filling in those little holes here and there, you know, finding a missile every now and then that like, like holy shit, I would have paid forty bucks for this. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Paul, what's what's something that you've seen come through the shop that you were kind of surprised to see it come through Toy Jar? I mean, all those action. The thing that comes to mind right now is all those action masters. Oh, that really? you just got. Yeah, because I just hadn't seen them all together before, even though they're not like 100% complete or anything. It's just cool to see. If, if I remember correctly, you bought this from someone. It seemed like they kept all the G1 characters, like yeah. the the sun, you know, the cartoon characters. But they're like, ah, Skyfall, who's that? Jackpot, who's that? All these characters that like, you know, pe- people would kind of flip to get some of those now. And they all look immaculate. They're all great. They're not. So these, these up are at anything. the store right now. Well, <laughs> well. Or did someone buy them? <laughs> uh, no, I don't know if you saw the follow-up post. Like I put it in our stories. Uh, three of them made it into the store. Meh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to be paying paying more attention to your Instagram. It's apparently the thing I'm missing here. <laughs> Actually, there's a there's a pretty cool piece here that I got. So one of the people that watched the store for us um, a few years back. He, uh, the people that watch the stores, they, they, they don't purchase, like they can't buy from people that, you know, they have to tell them like, wait for Sam to come back in and he'll go through your stuff. So the way that my friend approached this conversation was completely wrong. And just like the, the backwards way to do it, where this guy brought in a duffel bag full of, uh, those old LJN wrestlers, Oh, just yeah. like threw them on the ground and he's there with his wife. And the guy was like, what can you give me for these? And so my friend watching the shop just went, uh, nothing because that was his way of saying like, or leading into saying like, I I can't buy. And his wife said sold and made him leave them there. So I gained all these figures. Like the LJ <laughs> figures are crazy, you know, now like they're, they're up there in price now, but, uh, this guy was hanging out in there too. Just the, oh, wow. And this one's beat to shit, but this is mine. And I, I know that this figure, in this condition, even with the little booty rubs, this is like a 250 buck figure right now, you know? Wild. Wow. And that was literally just thrown on the floor and <laughs> left for free. Bananas. Easy. Free your best offer. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Nothing? <laughs> Sold. God, that's so, <laughs> there's so much loaded like yeah. animosity in that exchange. That is great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> lady, he could have bought you a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> well, you 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 alluded to this briefly, but like something very recently cool happened to the store. Just so happened, you know, we 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 want to talk about comics and stuff, but like this, we should we should at least bring this up. You were feature your store was featured on its own episode of the Amazon Prime show, a toy store near you. Yeah, is that right. Right. Accurate. Uh, That's right. the same the same creative team behind the toys, toys that made us, us, the movies that made us, what the you know whatever made you. You know they made all these. Yeah, they they've actually like we they've come into our um, world now because we know all this stuff that they've done, but they've been producing comedy specials for years and years. So like they've been around for a while. But they just, you know, started getting that bug, and I think it's because the the owner Brian just he's a he's a toy guy, and so they they started dipping into this stuff, um, and they kind of had like this network of shops like ours that they'd reach out to every time a new season of a toy store or uh, um, toys that made us came out, they'd reach out to everybody and be like, hey, will you do some sort of viewing or like put up a poster in your shop or something like that. So they already had this network of, of shops that they knew, like they were friends with, and they would all visit whenever they were in whatever area. Uh, so when the world ended in March of 2020, they emailed all these shops and they're like, hey, can you shoot some footage of your shop? Talk about having to shut down, talk about like you, you know, your history and where you, where you came from and all this stuff and just how everything's affecting you. Uh so we did that. Like we, we rushed to get it done, and it sounded like this was something they were throwing up the next weekend. 
you know. <laughs> um, so we recorded that early 2020, and then early 2021, they emailed us, and they're like, here's your pickup shots. <laughs> like, oh, okay, all right, cool. This is still happening. This is and happening. By, yeah, by that point, they had already aired a couple seasons, uh, um, even with some other Chicago shops, uh, Brick or Brack and Smash Toys. Um, so, yeah, our episode just aired this Christmas, uh, Christmas Day, uh, part of season four. And uh, um, apparently it's it's doing well. Like, we, we've gotten a lot of feedback on it, and we didn't uh, barf on camera, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Always a bonus, yeah. that. <laughs> that's only been live, you know, less than a week at this point, so it's real fresh. And if you have yeah. Amazon Prime, you can watch the show. Like, there's this is the fourth season. And yeah. I'd, rec- I'd recommend well, it. I, I mean, if you're listening to, you, to this, you would like the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What were you saying, Phil? I said, why am I talking to you, Jerks, if I can go watch that? <laughs> <laughs> Great <Yeah>. question. <laughs> but yeah, everyone should check that out if, if you can't. It's, it's, it's cool. I watched it at the, the uh, live premiere the other day, and it was, it was fun. Fun time. Was that with a friend of the show, uh, Orson? It was, yes. He came uh, an hour after it aired, but uh, we had a good time anyways. <laughs> well, circling back uh, topic-wise, like, so with, with seeing how the license was operated and how they ended up losing it in the way that, th- you know, a business decision happened and, and Devil's Do no longer had the license for G.I. Joe, seeing that happen back in the late like what 2010 ish you know now we're in 2011 and lo and behold these licenses from hasbro are in are in shift again and i don't i don't want to i don't i'm not up to date so maybe nick you can tell me what is the current status rumor situation with nothing uh, has changed in in the last week the current rumor um was that kirkman's company was pitching for it but that's what that's going to mean you know it's, uh, yeah, Skybound. Um, it could be that things could continue elsewhere. Uh, you know, we were thinking maybe Boom or like Marvel or somebody, but there's nothing. There's nothing concrete coming out of anywhere right now. Well, let's just take what we know or what is in the ether. It sounds like Skybound might get this license. They're and probably like, the front runner based on what we've heard, but so no. It, Going through the experience you've gone through with working for someone that had the Hasbro license, like, is there anything to read between the lines here or to be like, oh, this means this? Like, any any sort of insight you could potentially give or advice you could pre- <laughs> offer up to Skybound <laughs> at this point? No, I am in no position to give advice to Skybound. <laughs> and uh, besides, that would be a consulting fee. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, no, I, I personally feel like if we've heard this much, then it's a done deal. Like that's, that's Mm. just what I feel, you know, I don't, I don't follow, uh, comic rumors or the industry really closely at all myself now, but like for something this big, uh, to get rumblings, I, I feel like there has to be at least a nugget of truth there, you know? And I, I'm personally excited for Skybound to get it if that if that's where it goes. Yeah, the thing that really surprised me about it was that it was the Hollywood Reporter mm-hmm. that said, "Oh, Skybound is in talks." It's like, right? Hmm. <laughs> that's not like bleeding cool or like CBR. That's right. And Hollywood Reporter is going to comment on that specifically because of the success of The Walking Dead on television with Skybound. So yeah. there's more credence for them to go into that than anyone else. And that might be part of Skybound's pitch is just like, hey, look at us. We make real news. Look at the coverage we're getting. That's why you leak that. That would make some sense. We we unravel so so many threads. (laughs) What was it like, Sam, after Devil's Due lost the license? What what was sort of the attitude at that place then? Uh, I mean, it wasn't all doom and gloom, but it, it was... I mean, the writing was on the wall as far as like, you know, like this, this book has paid the bills monthly for a while now, you know, and just to lose that, it's like, hey, like, like, we're not all going to be sitting in the same room, you know, and it, it literally did that for a while, like it went to a smaller office with people working remotely, but then like, 
like with any company and like i can't fault josh for this but like like any company like when you realize that you can make money at a burger king with a skeleton crew like you're not really hiring you know like the whole everybody's getting pissed off at fast food restaurants right now because there's three people working you know it's it's because that manager or the owner found out like oh we're still making money and i'm only paying three people cool you know it's so, working yeah <laughs> yeah <clears throat> uh so I don't know. There, there was focus. Like we shifted to our creator own stuff at, at, at the time, but then, you know, even that stuff, you know, it's a creator own. They, they could take the book wherever they want. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just remember like some of the. <laughs> uh, I, I, I wrote this in that forward that I did recently for that that Joe comic book, uh, but I, I cut it out because I thought it was just kind of too much. Uh, <laughs> but when we lost the Joe license. Um, I looked into the uh, is it Ernest Ernie Pyle the the story of GI Joe the original movie that they got the name from like it's an old like 40s or 50s movie it's called the story of GI Joe and I was like can we get that license can we literally do a book called the story of GI Joe like based <laughs> on that <laughs> that one didn't fly but the one that I suggested we actually did a zero issue of was the the knockoff brand the core the Lenard toy line. Oh, we did like just kind of like a, as a, a a little f you like you know we're gonna we're gonna go to your bootleg competition and we <laughs> we did we put out a zero issue and then found out that there is zero <laughs> interest <laughs> <laughs> so like the issue one I think issue one was written and drawn but like we never pr- printed it you know mm. yeah and it it was straight out the gate it was like here's a bunch of people die and here's a bunch of boobs like this is the stuff that we've been held back for <laughs> that's it's almost like uh rob liefeld getting fired off of captain america and then he and jeff Loeb go do the fighting american because i'm gonna do my own with blackjack and hookers <laughs> yeah. with yeah. guns and boobs <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sam is there do you feel like it's a, a tenuous business model for a combo company that does mainly licensed books oh no i i okay i don't think so and i i I think uh we're all aware of that now and like i i think josh has put his his foot back in the licensing pool a little bit but he hasn't gone after something crazy like that i i think the literally the last license thing i saw him do was trailer punk boys because he was like this is something i like and i want to be (laughs) decent Yeah, <clears throat> but yeah, to 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 put all your eggs into one licensor like that—that's you know, it's it's not the best business model. Yeah, it's always good to be diversified in some way, if if possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we always did. I mean, we we had other licenses, like we did all that horror stuff. We did a uh, uh, child's play book. Um, we did Halloween. We did Family Guy, like we we. Oh yeah. For that, we did um. Oh, there's some. I other forgot stuff. about that we Family Guy book. Hazard stuff. We did the uh, like the Dungeons and Dragons stuff. We did Dragonlands and Forgotten Realms. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I, I'd say our best relationship, or like the easiest company we've ever worked with, was World Events Productions, which is why Toy Du Jour did that official Voltron show. Uh, oh. they're, they're so easy to work with. It was. Like, I went literally back to the person that I had an email for, and I was like, hey, can we do a show? And she was like, absolutely, that's awesome. Voltron, woo! <laughs> <All right, cool." laughs> and yeah, like, as a, as a licensor, like, working on their book it was so great, because they were just like, yeah, we're, we're along for the ride. Like, whatever you want to do, let's do it. It's cool. Well, that's, it's pretty much just owned by a f- the family, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. So, yeah, they kind of get to... It's not a corporate entity with a bunch of, like, sh- you know, stakeholders, so... I think- I think it might now be like with that whole Netflix deal. I think it might be owned by mm-hmm. Dreamwave uh, Production. DreamWorks. Works. DreamWorks. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I think it might be. I I don't remember, but I, I feel like there's something. Oh, there was there was a company that sent me some sort of like sign this deal when we were doing the art show, and it was like you a know, parent company. That could be the same thing that goes on with Mattel and Masters of the Universe. DreamWorks owns. Um, Classics Media, which used to be Filmation, 
So they own the rights and uh, licensing to all things animation, whereas mm-hmm. Mattel still owns the proprietary um, characters, logos, all that for the toys mm-hmm. for Masters of the Universe. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's something like that with them in um, World. So yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, I, I have to I have to give credit where credit's due when it comes to. Uh, what you guys did with G.I. Joe, and this is a component in comics that a lot of people aren't going to want to talk about because people like to change history when it comes to comics. Mm-hmm. But um, there is a period where Image Comics wasn't as hot as as it was, and it's certainly uh, not as hot as it is in the last 10 years. But licensed content, licensed properties, specifically starting with what you guys did on G.I. Joe – pulled images fat out of a fire and it's one of those things that a lot of people don't talk about and it wouldn't have happened if not for you guys and and i really i know that that's become kind of a uh, more of a footnote in images history but i do think it's something that needs to be remembered yeah yeah and i i I can see that being overlooked because of the leaps and bounds that they had afterwards you know sure it's easy to go from like all our beautiful '90s foil, red foil, <laughs> and connected to yeah. like what the image is today, you know, and then forget that little slump. And, and I, I feel and this is a weird little pet peeve of mine. Just when people say like, "Oh yeah, image," when they were publishing GI Joe, it's like, ah, we were literally nope. just using their their printing, <laughs> you know, oh, and yeah. they got their logo on our book. You know? General public does not understand how image works. <laughs> Yeah, and it does do the same thing. Like, we, we <gasps> published um, Street Fighter for Udon to begin yep. with for them to get their mm-hmm. football. That's the right. Um, there were some other, like, uh, Dabble Brothers. I don't know if Dabble Brothers still exists or existed after we did their Hedge Knight series, the R.R. Martin uh, Hedge Knight series. Um, yeah, so, I mean, same thing. Like, we, because we had a relationship with a printer at that point, that's all that is, you know. Mm-hmm. Yep. You can come to us, and your comic company is published under our banner. That's it. The, rea- mm-hmm. the reality was the hottest creator owned title Image was doing at that period was uh, Girls by the Luna Brothers. If it wasn't that, it mm-hmm. was the licensed stuff. It was G.I. Joe. It was Battle of the Planets. It was that stuff that really brought people back into a comic shop. Yeah. Oh, you just remind me how much I like that Girls series. That was good. <laughs> All that stuff. <laughs> Girls was such a good book, man. Well, that was 2005, so Walking Dead was around by that point. Yeah, but remember, Walking Dead had a hiatus. There was only the first four issues to come out, and because it was a it was a low order, then they didn't do anything. Then Invincible and Walking Dead came back. Oh, I don't think I remembered that. <laughs> yeah, there was there was space between. Wacky. Where did Paul? Go? I still I... pulled World War Three out. I still love that book. It's still so satisfying. It's on my nightstand right now. <laughs> I love it. It's, it, it's you know, yeah. it, it's it's just it's so so satisfying. Everything about it, and it, it's it's the perfect period at the end of the sentence. That's a that's one of the other pieces of artwork. If I have it here, hold on. Ooh. Oh yeah, this one here. <laughs> um, so this is from issue thirty six. That's the final issue of World War Three. Our final Joe book. Um, Mike Bear was one of the main artists at the time, and he was in house. Uh, I walked past his desk one day, and I <laughs> paid him for this page before he was finished drawing it. Your <laughs> hawk gets his jetpack. Oh, oh, that's oh, so wow. cool! Oh my god! Yeah, Mike Bear from JSA. Look at his little flopping sock right there. <laughs> <laughs> because in oh, our if where Hawk was wheelchair bound at that point. Oh, yeah. So yeah. That's his legs flapping in the wind because he didn't have control over them at this point. Uh, and that's the first time he ever had a little jetpack on in the comics. That's awesome. Uh, which is a throwback so cool. to... Where is he hiding? He's up here somewhere, right? To that 1991. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know where he is. He's here somewhere. You know, one of the, one of the real st- uh, kind of standout moments, and, and it's so funny because it's done for laughs, but I love it is when all the Joes are um, answering the call, reuniting back together. And 
poor bazooka <laughs> trying to put the football jersey back on and everything Aww. and it's just yeah. you know <laughs> not everybody was in tip top shape when that call came back <laughs> I, I love that it, it it i always get such a smile out of that <laughs> yeah yeah he he got back in shape though i'd say like yep. you know half a year later or whatever he was he was he was there again <laughs> <laughs> no that was a good one um there was oh there was something in the Joe Transformers series in volume two. I only have this digitally, but um, there was another Hasbro thing about how much skin we could show, where we had to redraw and we uh, Tim Seeley. I think it was mm-hmm. these pages here with Lady J and Roadblock, uh, where they were too scantily clad, so their underwear had to be elongated. Oh. <laughs> more so we have the original pencils I, ha- I have them digitally uh where they're showing a lot more skin but that was just a, a weird like here yeah oh well <laughs> oh, panel like that i i, I kind of get it <laughs> <laughs> so sam what would you say is your uh favorite joe character favorite joe toy and favorite joe vehicle uh, well, if Tunnel Rat was a vehicle, that would answer all three. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love the 87 Joes. Like, that movie was, like, the highlight of my childhood. You know, just, I mean, obviously that intro to the G.I. Joe movie. Yeah. It's perfect, and they haven't been able to recreate it since on the big screen, and it's no. like, yeah, how do you yeah. not, like, anybody who's going to direct the G.I. Joe film, sit them down, make them watch that intro, and go, do that. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Yeah. So when we were at, we were at uh, the bar last night uh, watching our episode, like doing a live viewing, uh, the bartender came up to me afterwards and he was like, hey, I brought uh, Transformers the movie and G.I. Joe the movie. Can I throw them on afterwards? I was like, yes, but throw G.I. Joe on first because I want to see that intro right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're saying the Statue of Liberty with jetpacks. It's amazing. <sighs> so good. Yeah. And if, if that's touched on in that IDW series, if the IDW series happens, if they touch on that, like that intro, like that's that's a book in itself, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. Tunnel Rat. He's he's my guy. I always loved him. Uh. That '87 stuff. Like his character was so good. Where's he hiding? Oh, my '87 stuff over here. <laughs> I took his accessories off recently because I was trying to cast uh, copies of them. So yeah, Tunnel Rat, and then um, like as a character, like in the in the books, when we finally got to start messing with him. We brought him in on the, um, I think he was in the Special Missions Manhattan. Uh, that was great. Vehicle? No, I don't, I don't know. Like, it, like, usually our favorites are always the ones that you grew up with, you know? Like, it, it, rarely is it the one that you never got is your favorite. Like, it, that's the one you want, but it's, it's not your favorite, you know? Um, I don't know. Like, as far as vehicles, I, the Trouble Bubble's fantastic. Like the name, the ness <laughs> of it. I, I did usually uh, lean towards the the crazier stuff, like the buzz bore, like all day. Like I, I love it. Everything about <laughs> it, you know, makes absolutely no sense. But like, give me a buzz bore, man. Didn't isn't like Big Boa driving that in the artwork? But he like he's wearing boxing gloves or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, he is not. Uh, that's a that's a Cobra Viper on the. Oh, you're the, right. You're right. Yeah. Um, but like the alien stuff, like I, I love that stuff. Like all the stuff from the late nineties or the early nineties when they were doing the weird little dudes, like the Predacon and all that stuff. I love the weird stuff. Give me the Cobra La. <laughs> and it's the movie, you know, like I, I love that movie so much. Yeah, I, I always love the the more sci fi stuff of that. The the early G.I. Joe stuff where it was more realistic military vehicles was like, yeah it's kind of neat and then when they started getting like the cobra bug where it's like this swamp vehicle that has jet skis that come out of it and a big submarine pod that pops yeah. off like yeah that was okay, that, that vehicle was my awesome. sweet spot <laughs> yeah that's, that's a good one that's the the downside of uh the, the joe fandom is that you've got a mix of the people that are like oh, i love the pew 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 lasers and then it's like you got the guys that went into the army because of it, and then that's the other half of the fandom. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. all right, we we both saw this different ways, but all right, cool. 
Yeah. What's your, what's your take on the classified series? Uh, yeah, I, I, I had always assumed that Hasbro was putting that in their back pocket until they were like in some sort of financial trouble. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll do six inch shows as soon as, as soon as we need to. As soon as we need a license to print money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, when it started, I was like, well, I'm going to buy it because you're slapping a Joe logo on it. And that's just what I am. Like, you, you've got me like no problem. But there was there was things out the gate that I wasn't happy with. Um, just like most people with the, the weird design aesthetic uh, that they've since kind of like pulled back from. Like they realize that like, oh, we don't need to go crazy weird with this. Like we can we can do it old school and people will still be connected to it. Like they don't they're not like doing straight like reproductions of the, the original stuff, but like gearing it more towards that design versus like the, the weird like Fortnite Halo looking stuff they were trying to mix in. Um, like the original Red Ninja that they released, I was like, I don't know what this is. Like, this looks like nothing like that I, I know, but it again has a Joe logo on it, so it's going in the pile. Uh, but yeah, no. Now, now the new stuff. Like I'm, I'm foaming at the mouth for that bat and that alley vector. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like barbecue is a great, great toy. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, there he is. I've got the snake eyes with me right now, and classified is what got me back into collecting Joes again. Mm. Uh, it has been a pain in the ass, but uh, <laughs> it's exciting getting them in hand and just uh, going from that, that Duke where we started with this to the breaker I just got. Mm. And th- that breaker, all, all he's missing is some bubble gum. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a perfect toy. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> I, I love it. It's I pulled so the bubble fun. off of um, what's her Jubilee. name? Oh, Jubilee. Jubilee. I, I use I think her name's like Boom Boom or something like that. Boom Boom. Yeah. She yeah. has one too. Yeah. I got lucky. The bubble gum bubble broke off of my Jubilee figure, so now it's gonna go with Breaker. <laughs> <laughs> I wish he had come with a pistol or something too. I'm using uh, one of the pistols from Snake Eyes for Breaker. Oh yeah. yeah I yeah. pulled guns off of a Deadpool. I pulled a pistol off of a Deadpool for him. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I is, now that we've got our Alley Viper, I can stop screaming about Alley Viper, and now I'm like, "Where's my Night Viper? Like, give me a Night Viper <laughs> immediately." <clears throat> I think those are. I mean, those are my two favorite like Cobra designs. Like the Alley Viper, of course. That's the the uh, Battle Tribes figure that, or sorry, Warlords of War figure that we did. Uh, the little Glios figure. I don't know if he's gonna show up. Or... Awesome. Yeah. So we did that Alley Viper aesthetic. Um, I was I was so close to ordering one of those, but like I'm trying really hard to be good and only buy Transformer things right now. God damn it! Join us. <laughs> well, those guys went real fast, so you didn't have yeah. to work too long. Yeah, yeah. And then like Night Viper, I, I love that that black and green together. I've always loved that. Actually, I've done a. Hold on, let me grab it. I have a custom that I made real quick. If you don't understand the reference here, <laughs> then something's wrong. Oh my god. <laughs> That's great. Nice. Yeah. I mean, as soon as that figure came out, I was like, oh, he should be this color. Yeah. <laughs> Lucas, did you learn anything tonight? I, l- I learned a lot. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, Joe is not my forte. So I figured I'd let you guys, um, you know, take the reins on, on the episode. So, but, uh, but yeah, I, re- I really appreciate you, uh, joining us and, and talking shop and, and everything. It's, it's been great. It's been a fun episode. Right on. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's cool to see behind the curtain a little bit like this. You know, we always have, as fans, you know, you dissect everything that happens and then everyone comes up with their crazy theories of why the company did this or that. And it's always so much simpler than the fan <laughs> theory. But, you know, sometimes it's like, hey, yeah. we need we need to make some money this month. So we're going to do this repaint. Or we're going to do that. You know, it's, it, that kind of comes down to simple decisions that have long lasting effects. And I think uh, you were involved with a lot of those that Devils do, it sounds like. So, yeah, I mean. Let's print a convention cover because we know that's going to make us some money, you know. That's literally it. Well, I think, Sam, how do people uh, find you? Nick mentioned your great social media presence. How do they find that? 
Uh, if you spell toy de jour wrong with a D-E instead of a D-U, we're on everything. <laughs> toy de jour. Yeah. All one. Toy de jour. At toy de jour. Go find it. Is in your shops it. in Chicago? If we, if we didn't specify, if we didn't make that oh, specifically yeah. clear. Yeah. You actually in Chicago come look at me. Yeah, come look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the Logan Square neighborhood. It's at 2532 West Fullerton. Uh, just blocks of the Kennedy Expressway. <laughs> Does anybody remember that commercial? The, uh, <laughs> that commercial? So I do. Like three blocks west of the Kennedy Expressway. <laughs> We're literally like just down the street from Tile Outlet. So. <laughs> oh, you're talking oh Tile Outlet commercial. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and let, let's also mention the the show on Amazon Prime. That's a toy store near you, and you are season four, episode three. Right? Yep. Yeah. But you can watch them all. That's fine. <laughs> watch them all so you can see how good or bad we are compared to the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, thanks well, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for joining us. And thank you guys also uh, for joining us, too. Thanks, TJ, for, uh, for coming in as well. So. Thank you. Hey, hey there, Super 7. You got any G.I. Joe news you could share? <laughs> or Transformers uh, news? <laughs> yeah 2022 is going to be a really great year for gi joe at super seven um a lot of really really cool stuff coming on the reaction side a lot of cool stuff happening on the ultimate side uh transformers lots to be excited about as well um we just uh released the super cyborg shattered glass optimus prime and that is our first foray into shattered glass and hopefully not our last but um, a lot of really good stuff happening uh, on the Hasbro side of stuff. I think you guys are all going to be really excited. Nice, nice. Yeah, I feel like we uh, might have to have you on as well, TJ, because I know you guys dropped some of the new uh, Transformers. Uh, I think Wave 3, I think, just went up, right? Yep. Uh, yep, for Ultimates. Uh, very <laughs> excited. with, And I say this with my own uh, little heart flutter here. With our first IDW era figure, uh, which oh. is cool because um, he debuted at the time that I was working there, Tarn. So, uh, really, really excited about seeing him show up. Um, and Nickel. Yes, oh. yes. <laughs> so, um, there, there's a lot of really neat stuff happening. I'm, I'm always happy to talk. So, Sounds good. Well, thank you guys, and um, I guess we will uh, see everyone uh, next week, or next year, I should say, I guess, nope. uh, by the time uh, this airs and we have our next episode. So, yeah. Well, thanks, guys. We'll see. Bye. Bye, guys.